Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the Kelly Writers House. It's good to see so many people here. Um, I'm glad there are extra chairs in the back. Um, and just on camera, I'm going to tell you if people come in, can you help them find chairs in the perfect? Thank you. So, welcome to our second uh, Writers Without Borders event of the semester. We're uh, really really delighted and, and, and thrilled to have this kind of series that allows us to think expansively, um, inclusively, globally, to really um, reach beyond just the immediate um, for, our, for our series programming here. Um, I'd like to thank Seth Gins in particular, who is the alumnus who supports this series. Um, it's his vision that helps make this happen. And also the um, Office of the Provost, who, um, for whom we've actually named this series. Um, but what a program for tonight. Um, when I started spreading the word that uh, Chimamanda Adichie would visit, I was greeted, I think, universally by something like ecstasy. I've been, re <laughs> I've been receiving emails, and we've been getting phone calls all day, people saying, wait a minute, do I need to RSVP? Do I need to RSVP? And we don't, we don't usually take RSVPs, so that question has, has thrown us a little bit, because you know, anybody can come, and we say, just come on, on, come on in. But there's some energy around this reading, which makes this truly an event. Um, as many of you know, uh, Chimamanda Adichie is the author of the novels Purple Hibiscus and Half, a Ye Half of a Yellow Sun, and the short story collection The Thing Around Your Neck, which we have in the back, a few copies if you'd like to purchase a copy. We do have it um, for a nonprofit price, so it's a good, good chance to pick it up. Um, she's received numerous awards and distinctions, including the Orange Broadband Prize for Fiction, a, a MacArthur Genius Grant, um, and more recently, uh, she was named one of the New Yorker magazine's 20 under 40. Uh, in other words, 20 young writers who are in some way key to their generation, and according to the editors, who capture the inventiveness and the vitality of contemporary American fiction. So lists like that could be controversial. Um, who didn't make it? Who did? Who shouldn't have? And I think this is a particularly interesting choice, a, a selection of generationally key American fiction writers. Um, Ms. Adichie is Nigerian-born. She divides her time between the US and Nigeria, as do many characters in, in this newest book. Uh, much of her writing deals in a realist mode with, with post-colonial Nigeria, either as large-scale backdrop to the familial drama, as in Purple Hibiscus, in which the, the family is sort of crumbling along with, with the country, or as even more explicit narrative center, as in Half of a Yellow Sun, a, a devastating portrayal of the horror and destruction of Nigerian civil war. Um, as one reviewer put it, uh, she writes about families living and dying against a backdrop of roiling political and social turbulence. I'd say as a generationally key kind of writing, this seems not just a good choice, but a necessary choice. Um, her work is character driven, which means it's driven by complexities of emotion while dealing with all of these large materials of history, culture, and something like the news. Um, on a really personal note, when, when I was a new mom last year, um, about 15 months ago, I was pretty much unable to read anything new. I wasn't able to read fiction. I wasn't able to read the news. I wasn't able to read history. I just, I just wasn't able to read um, time, just time, and also desire. I, I couldn't read anything. Um, but I did read Purple Hibiscus, and, and it gripped me at a time when I, I just didn't have desire to read. I didn't, I didn't have the capacity to read. Uh, partly, I think I, I read that novel because it's a coming-of-age story. It's a story about parenting and family. Um, and though it's at times a seriously painful book and difficult book, and just as reviewers said, it's engaged with political and social turmoil, it's a story with a deep emotional center that, that fed me. And it kept me reading, even when I, I quite literally could not read anything else. So I think there's something truly magical about that kind of writing. It's at once real and it's world making. Please help me welcome. I should say, first off, there will be room for a question and answer period um, after her reading, um, and then also a, a short reception in the dining room. So think about some questions you might have. But please help me welcome Chimamanda Adichie.
thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. It's a very kind um, introduction. And thank you all so much for coming. It's so nice to be to be here in this. Um, when Jessica said that it was a cottage, I thought a cottage. <laughs> so so it's actually, it's, it's um, and I don't know, cottage just makes me think of, I don't know, um, fairy tales. But it's really lovely to be, and it's such a fantastic space. And it's um, just really nice to be here. And it's also really nice to be back in Philadelphia. I, Philadelphia was my, um, my introduction to America. So when I first came to the US, I, I lived here for two years. I went to Drexel for two years before I left and, and fell in love with Philadelphia. And still am very much in love with Philadelphia. And I'm actually working on, on a novel, which I hope will be finished at some point. But I, I thought I would read a section from the novel that is set in Philadelphia. So it's sort of about this character who, uh, who lives in Philadelphia, who, who goes to school in Philadelphia. And, and in this bit that I'm going to read, she's taking a train journey to, um, to Connecticut. But anyway, I, I'll just read. I won't set up too much. But also just to say that um, I'm really, really pleased as well to have somebody very special here, Miriam Cutson, who was my professor at Drexel, and who um, I took her class um, in creative writing. And she was just, you know, one of the the kind of teacher that you hope to have if you're a writer who who sort of know you, you know you want to write but you sort of need somebody who th also thinks that you should write and she she was she was that and um so, <laughs> so it's really nice to have her so i'm just i'm going to read and then um i'll be happy to take questions and and comments uh, we can talk about the weather as well afterwards Ifemelu decided to stop faking an American accent on a sun-splashed day in July, the same day she met Blaine. It was convincing, the accent. She had perfected, from careful watching of friends and newscasters, the blurring of the T, the creamy roll of the R, the tilt of some sentences, and the sliding response of, oh, really? But the accent creaked with consciousness, an act of will rather than an organic absorption. If she were in a panic or in terror or jerked awake from sleep, she would not remember the curl of tongue that produced those American sounds. And so she resolved to stop, a decision prompted by a telemarketer's call. She was in her apartment on Spring Garden Street in Philadelphia the first that was truly hers in America, a studio with a leaky faucet and a noisy heater. In the two weeks since she moved in, she had felt light-footed, cloaked in well-being, because she opened the fridge knowing that everything in it was hers and cleaned the bathtub knowing she would not find tufts of disconcertingly foreign roommate hair in the drainage. <laughs> Officially two blocks away from the real hood was how the apartment super Jamal had put it when he told her to expect to hear gunshots from time to time. But although she opened her window every evening, straining and listening, all she heard were the sunny sounds of late summer, the laughter of high-spirited children and the shouting of their mothers. On that sun-splashed morning, her weekend bag already packed for Connecticut, she was making scrambled eggs when the phone rang. The caller ID showed unknown, and she thought it might be a call from family in Nigeria. It was a telemarketer, a young male American who was offering better long distance and international rates. She always hung up on telemarketers, but there was something uncertain, touching about his voice that made her reduce the stove heat and hold on to the receiver. A tremor in his tone an aggressive customer service friendliness that was not aggressive at all. It was as though he was saying what he had been trained to say, but was mortally worried about offending her. How are you doing today? How's the weather where you are? It's pretty hot down here in Phoenix. Perhaps it was his first day on the job, his telephone poking uncomfortably in his ear, while he half hoped people would not be home to pick up when he called. Because she felt strangely sorry for him, she asked whether he had rates better than 57 cents a minute to Nigeria. Hold on while I look up Nigeria, he said, and she went back to stirring her eggs. 
He came back and said his rates were the same, but wasn't there another country that she called? Mexico, Canada. <laughs> well, I call London sometimes, she said. Okay, hold on while I look up France, he said. <laughs> she burst out laughing. Something funny over there, he asked. She laughed harder. She had opened her mouth to say that what was funny was that he was selling international telephone rates and did not know where London was. But something held her back, an image of him, perhaps 18 or 19, overweight, pink-faced, keen on video games, no plans to go to college, and eager to someday become a manager of a video shop. So she said, oh, there's a hilarious old comedy on TV. Oh, really? He said, and he laughed too. It broke her heart, his greenness. And when he came back on to tell her the France rates, she thanked him and said they were better than the rates she already had and that she would think about switching careers. When is a good time to call you back, if that's okay, he said. He was reading off his handbook. He had captured the, cu he had captured the customer's interest and follow-up was crucial. She wondered whether they were paid on commission would his paycheck be bigger if she did switch her phone company? Because she would, as long as, as it cost her nothing. Evenings are best, she said. May I ask who I'm talking to? My name is Ifemelo. He repeated it with exaggerated care. Ifemelo. Is it a French name? <laughs> no, Nigerian. Is that where your family came from? Yes. She scooped the eggs onto a plate. I grew up there. Oh, really? How long have you been in the US? Three years. Wow, cool. You sound totally American. Thank you. <laughs> Only after she hung up did she begin to feel a burgeoning shame for thanking him, for feeling proud, for crafting his words, you sound American, into a garland that she hung around her own neck. Why did she feel the need for pride? Why was it a, a compliment, an accomplishment to sound American? And so she finished eating her eggs and resolved to stop faking her American accent. She first spoke without the American accent that afternoon at 38th Street Station, leaning toward the woman behind the Amtrak counter. Could I have a round trip to Hartford, please? Returning Sunday afternoon, I have a student advantage card. A rush came with giving the tea its full due in advantage. With not an <laughs> 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 advantage. With, <laughs> with, <laughs> with with not rolling her R in Hartford. So she didn't say Hartford. This was truly this was truly her. This was the voice with which she would speak if she were woken up in a panic. Still, she resolved that if the Amtrak woman responded to her accent by speaking too slowly as though to an idiot, then she would put on her Mr. Abo voice. <coughs> the mannered, over-careful pronunciations she had learned during debate meetings back in Osaka when the bearded Mr. Abo, tugging at his frayed tie, played BBC recordings on his cassette player, and then made all of the students pronounce words over and over until he beamed and cried, correct. She would also affect, with the Mr. Abo voice, a slight raising of her eyebrows in what she imagined was a haughty foreigner pose. But there was no need to do any of these because the Amtrak woman spoke normally. Can I see an ID, miss? And so she did not use her Mr. Abu voice until she met Blaine. The train was crowded. The seat next to Blaine was the only empty one in that car, as far as she could see, and the newspaper and bottle of juice placed on it seemed to be his. She stopped, gesturing toward the seat, but he kept his gaze levelly ahead. A woman was pulling along a heavy suitcase behind Ifemelo, and the conductor was announcing that all personal belongings had to be moved from, s from free seats. And Blaine saw her standing there. There was no way that he could not have seen her, and still did nothing. So her Mr. Abo voice emerged. Excuse me, are these yours? Could you possibly move them? 
She placed her bag on the overhead rack and settled onto the seat, stiffly holding her magazine, her body aligned toward the aisle and away from him. The train had begun to move when he said, I'm really sorry, I didn't see you standing there, I was lost in thought. It surprised her, his apologizing, and he was so earnest that she smiled and said it was okay, and then felt awkward because she was not sure whether his apology signaled a beginning of conversation. How are you? He asked. She had learned to say, good, how are you? In that sing-song American way, but now she said, I'm well. My name's Blaine, he said, and extended his hand. She repeated his name, Blaine. He looked tall, a man with skin the color of gingerbread and the kind of body that was perfect for a uniform, any uniform. She knew, ri she knew, she knew right away that, that he was African-American, not Caribbean, not African, not a child of immigrants from either place. She had not always been able to tell once, she had asked a taxi driver, so where are you from, with familiarity, certain that he was from Ghana, and he said, Detroit, with a shrug. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but the longer she spent in America, the better she had become at distinguishing, sometimes from looks and gait, but mostly from bearing and demeanor, that whiff that culture stamps on people. She felt confident about Blaine. He was a descendant of the black men and women who had built America. I'm Ife Melo, it's nice to meet you, she said. Are you Nigerian? He asked. I am, yes. Bougie Nigerian, he said and <laughs> smiled. There was a surprising and immediate intimacy to his teasing her, calling her privileged. Well, just as bougie as you, she said. They were on firm, flirting territory now. She looked, she looked him over slowly, his light-colored khakis and navy shirt, the kind of outfit that was selected with some thought, a man who looked at himself in the mirror but did not look for too long. He knew about Nigerians, he told her. He was an assistant professor at Yale, and although his interest was mostly in Southern Africa, how could he not know about Nigerians when they were everywhere? <laughs> what is it? One in every five Africans is Nigerian, he asked, still smiling. There was something both ironic and gentle about him. It was as if he believed that they shared a series of intrinsic jokes that did not need to be verbalized. Yes, we get around, we have to. There are too many of us and not enough space, she said. She was facing him now and it struck her how close to each other they were, separated only by the single armrest. He spoke the kind of American English that she had just given up, the kind that made race pollsters on the telephone assume that you were white and educated. So, is Southern Africa your discipline, she asked. No, comparative politics. You can't do just Africa in political science graduate programs in this country. You can compare Africa to Poland or Israel, <laughs> but focusing on Africa itself, they don't let you do that. His use of they suggested an us, which would be the both of them. His nails were clean. He was not wearing... <laughs> he, he was not wearing a wedding band. She began to imagine a relationship, both of them waking up in the winter, cuddling in the glare of the morning light, drinking British breakfast tea. She hoped he was one of those Americans who liked tea. His juice, the bottle stuffed in the pouch in front of him, was organic pomegranate. The plain brown bottle label was stylish, but plain. No chemicals in the juice and no ink wasted on decorative labels. Where had he bought it? It was not the sort of thing that was sold at the train station. Perhaps he was vegan and distrusted large corporations and shopped only at farmers markets and brought his own organic juice from home. She had little patience for her friends who were like that. Their righteousness left her feeling both irritated and lacking. But she was prepared to forgive his pieties. He was holding a hardcover library book whose title she could not see and had stuffed a folded copy of the New York Times next to his juice bottle. When he glanced at her magazine, she wished she had brought out the Gail Jones novel in her handbag. 
or the Isiaba Irobi book of poems that she had planned to read on the train back. He would think that she read only shallow fashion magazines. She felt the sudden and unreasonable urge to tell him how much she loved the poetry of Yusef Komunyaka to redeem herself. First, she shielded with her palm the bright red lipstick on the cover model's face. Then she reached forward and pushed the magazine into the pouch in front of her and said with a slight sniff that it was absurd how these magazines forced images of small-boned, small-breasted white women on the rest of the multi-boned, multi-ethnic world of women to emulate. But he merely shrugged. He had not even been thinking of her magazine. Are you a graduate student, he asked. I'm a senior, she said. Did she imagine it or did his face fall in disappointment? Really? You seem more mature somehow. Well, I am. I don't <laughs> 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 I'd, done, I'd done three years of university in Nigeria before I left to come here. She shifted on her seat, determined to get back on firm, flirting ground. You, on the other hand, look too young to be a professor. Your students must be confused about who the professor is. <laughs> oh, I think they're probably confused about a lot of stuff. This is my second year. Where did you go to graduate school? Michigan. He paused. Are you thinking of graduate school? I have some friends in grad school, and just listening to them talk is scary. Dialectic, ray fi they live in a parallel universe of academia and they don't really know what's happening in the real world. She felt clever to have said this, but then she wondered whether she had offended him until he chuckled. I see what you're saying, he said. My research interests include social movements, the political economy of dictatorships, American voting rights and representation, race and ethnicity in American politics and campaign finance. That's my classic spiel, much of which is bullshit anyway. I teach my classes and I wonder if any of it matters to the kids. Oh, I'm sure they, they, they love it. I'd love to take one of your classes. She had spoken too eagerly. It had not come out as she wanted. She had cast herself without meaning to into the role of a potential student. He seemed keen to change the direction of the conversation. Perhaps he too did not want to be her teacher. He told her he was going back to New Haven after visiting family in Washington, D.C. So where are you going, he asked. Andover. It's a small town outside Hartford to visit my relatives. It's my cousin's birthday tomorrow. So, you come to Connecticut often? Yes, I've never been to New Haven, but I've gone to the malls in Stamford and Clinton. Oh yes, malls. You don't like malls? Apart from being soulless and bland, they're perfectly fine. She had never really understood the quarrel with malls, with the notion of finding exactly the same shops in all of them. She found them quite comforting in their sameness. And with his carefully chosen clothes, surely he had to shop somehow. <laughs> but she said, yes, I can see how malls are not for everyone. It was not in her nature to talk to strangers and public transportation, but she talked and talked perhaps because of the newness of her own voice, the discovery of a self long suppressed. The more they talked, the more she told herself that this was no coincidence. There was a symbolism to her meeting this man on the day that she returned her voice to herself. She told him with the suppressed laughter of a person impatient for the punchline of her own joke about the telemarketer who thought that London was in France. He did not laugh but instead shook his head in a manner that made her feel bad. They don't train these telemarketer folks well at all. I bet he's a temp with no health insurance and no benefits, he said. Yes, she said, feeling chastened. I felt kind of sorry for him. So my department moved buildings a few weeks ago. Our offices and all the stuff in them. Yale hired professional movers and told them to make sure to put everything from each person's old office in the exact same spot in the new office. And they did. All my books were shelved in the right position. But you know what I noticed later? Many of the books had their spines upside down. He was looking at her as though to experience a shared revelation. And for a blank moment of panic, she was not sure what the story was about. Oh, the movers couldn't read, she said finally. 
He nodded. And I told one of my colleagues about it, and she laughed. There was just something about it that killed me. He let his voice trail away. She began to imagine what he would be like in bed. He would wake up even-tempered. He would be an attentive lover for whom emotional fulfillment was just as important as ejaculation. He would not judge her slack flesh. She hastily looked away, afraid he might have read her mind. Would you like a beer? He asked. A beer? Yes, the cafe serves beers. You want one? I'm going to get one. Yes, thank you. She stood up self-consciously to let him pass and hoped she would smell something on him, but she didn't. He did not wear cologne. Perhaps he had boycotted because the makers of cologne did not treat their staff well. <laughs> he, s he smiled at her and she watched him walk up the aisle knowing that he knew that she was watching him. The beer offer had pleased her. She had worried that all he drank was organic pomegranate juice. <laughs> but, now, but now, the thought of organic pomegranate juice was pleasant if he drank beer as well. When he came back with the beers and plastic cups, he poured hers with a flourish that was, in her mind, thick with romance. <laughs> she had never liked beer. Growing up, it had been male alcohol, gruff, and inelegant. Her mother drank wine and Guinness stout, and her childhood memories were full of sips of the bitter and fruity tastes that she still liked, from her mother's glasses that somehow smelled of her Chloe perfume. Now, sitting next to Blaine, laughing as he told her about the first time he got truly drunk in his freshman year, she realized that she could like beer. <laughs> <laughs> the grainy fullness of beer. He talked about his undergraduate years, about the stupidity of eating a semen sandwich during his fraternity initiation, about cons... <laughs> <laughs> Let me know if you have questions about that later. <laughs> about... <laughs> <laughs> he talked about his undergraduate years, about the stupidity of eating a semen sandwich during his fraternity initiation, about constantly being called Michael Jordan in China the summer of his junior year when he traveled through Asia, about his mother's death from cancer the week after he graduated. When the conductor announced that the next stop was New Haven, Ifemelu felt a stab of loss. She tore out a page from her magazine and wrote her phone number down for him. So do you have a card? She asked. He touched his pockets. I don't have any with me. There was silence while he gathered his things. Then the screeching of the train brakes. She sensed and hoped she was wrong that he did not want to give her his number. Well, will you write your number then if you remember it? <laughs> she asked. <laughs> it was a lame joke. The beer had pushed those words out of her mouth. He wrote his number down and said, you take care. He touched her shoulder lightly as he left, and there was something soft in his eyes, something almost aching, that made her tell herself that she had been wrong to sense reluctance from him. She moved to his seat, reveling in the warmth his body had left in its wake, and watched through the window as he walked along the platform. New Haven, she knew, would always be cast in soft light because of Blaine. When she arrived at her aunt's house in Andover, the first thing she wanted to do was call him. But she waited an hour, thinking of intelligent things she could say, a smart reason for calling so soon. Finally, she said, fuck it, and called. <laughs> he did not answer. She left a message. <laughs> She left a message. She called back later, no answer. She called and called and called, no answer. She called at midnight. She didn't, she didn't, she didn't. I sense that people are identifying with this and I'd like to hear stories. She, she called at midnight. She did not leave messages. The whole weekend, she called and called, and he never picked up the phone. Then she began to console herself, to convince herself that she had imagined it all. Thank you.